Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's Thursday uh, for most of you guys in the States and in the UK. It's um, Friday morning here in uh, Melbourne. It's 9.02 in the morning. Um, so just say hi. We've got a few now that are starting to come on board, um, which is good, because uh, I've got, again, a few things that I want to take you through, a few rumours, um, also just some news and just some general news that's sort of going around that I thought I'd be able to uh, share with you all. And then we can have a good chat and some questions. And I'm going to show you uh, a shoot um, as well that I've done just to sort of take you through that, how I did it. Um, and we can look at those sort of things all together. Um, so if you can, please give it a like, the, the, the actual page, so that we can get some more people on board. Um, we've got audio working now. We had a little bit of problems just before, but now it's all up and running. So I will cut that bit out um, as we go on. Um, so what I thought we'd start to look at um, first is uh, some news. But let me just see how many people are in. We've got quite a few now. Carl is there. Paul's there. Hi, Paul. Tim. Um, got a few in there now. I might just put my mouse up there so I can start to drag through these questions. I've got the questions on a big monitor that are up on my up on my wall that I actually um, show presentations to. Um, so what we'll do, I'm going to switch to news. So let me go over to this desktop because I want to talk about the um, the A72 uh, or three that uh, the rumours that have just been brought out. I know this was sort of um, talked about yesterday um, by a number of people, but I just thought I'd give my views about what I think it will actually look like. It's, it is an as actual SR5 on um, Sony Alpha rumours, so it looks like it is definitely going to happen. Usually, when they get to the SR5 um, rating, it's actually it, it's fairly confirmed that it's actually going to happen. Um, they're saying that some of the specs on this camera are that it is going to be the 24 megapixel sensor. Uh, they're saying that they think it's got the same sensor as the Sony A9. Uh, the autofocus system will be the same, except for it won't have the 20 frames per second feature. Um, it's going to have the touch screen, uh, the joystick control, 4K recording, and it's going to launch in the fall, which is um, spring here in uh Australia. Um, so I, I think this is obviously going to happen, but I've got a feeling that that's probably pretty close to what the ratings are or the things are going to be with this camera. But I do believe that they're going to have to make a difference between this and the A9. They can't basically take all the features of the A9 and put it into the A7 III. Clearly, if that was going to happen, no one would purchase the A9. So I don't think that the only difference could be the 20 frames per second. Um, I mean, I think probably you'll find this one will probably shoot around about the 8 frames per second because it will still be able to have the, the same features as what the Sony A9 has. But, but I think that they're going to probably have to have a major difference, and that's probably going to be the two SD cards. I don't think this camera will probably have that. Um, I've got a th a th I think that they may just keep that for the Sony A9 camera. Um, so... Yeah, now let me just see if I can bring up um, my picture into this just so that we can see a um, me in the lower right corner. And then at least you'll be able to see me in it. I'll just see if it works. It'd be good if I can get... No. Oh, here we go. I can just scale it. There we go. That'll be a bit better. At least you can see my ugly head as I'm talking. Um, yeah, so I've, I've got a feeling that that's probably what the difference is going to be, is that uh, they're not going to put the dual card slots in this camera. Um, so let me know if you think that's going to be the case. I'm just looking at a couple of people up here. Um, hi, Take the Shooter, you're here. Um, now, well, I'm not sure. Tag the Shooter has said, will I be getting it? Now, I don't know at this stage because, to be honest, I'm very, very happy with the A9 and also the A7R2. Um, so I may not get this camera. Uh, I mean, I do have two A7Is, so I may keep... I may sell those and then buy one of these. I'm not sure yet. I'll, I'll wait until I see it released and then I'll make a decision on whether I'm going to buy it or not. Um, at this stage, I'm quite comfortable using the A7, the A9 and the A7R2, so I'm not certain that I will upgrade to this yet, but knowing me, I probably will. Um, 
Tag the shooter said, yes, I would be really upset if the A7 III be close to the A9. I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're going to have to keep a difference. Um, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Tim Sorrell says, I'm thinking the A9, A9 line is going to be the pro version, although they can be used for pro work. Um, Tag the shooter said, two cards and 20 frames per second still isn't enough to separate them. Um, and Chad says, all modern cameras should come with dual slots. And I agree, Chad. I I'm totally agree with you there. They should all come with dual slots, but I don't think this new one will be. That's just what I'm feeling. Uh, the issue is that if you're talking about a camera that's $4,500 US, which is the A9, they can't make that camera too close to the A7 III because clearly no one would buy the A A9. To be honest, I think a lot of sports shooters are probably going to find if the A7 III came out with the same focus, um, the the joystick, everything else the same on it, you could still get by shooting sports sometimes at eight frames per second. I mean, you could get by doing that. They have to make this the A9 a step up, a big step up from what the um, A7 III will be. So that's why I think that I don't think the dual slots are going to be on it. I think that Sony are going to say if you are shooting professional, you need to be moving up to the A9 or the A9R, which will come out eventually, or the A9S. They will all have the dual card slots. I don't think the A7 series is going to have it, um, but we re it remains to be seen. Um, Tag the Shooter said, I'm only waiting for the A7R III or the A9R. Um, and... Uh, take the shoot also said how do you use your dual slot well the, the way that I'm using my dual slots in the A9 is I'm shooting raw to slot one because that's the fastest slot which means the most processing and I'm shooting JPEG to the slot two the only reason why I, I don't need to put raw on both because look the chances of anything failing is very very minor it's never happened to me before to be honest but the good thing is at least I've got a JPEG backup if that does happen so I could get by um and, and, you know, and keep working. So at least I've got that back up now. Um, and you know what, to be honest, I've always said I've never worried about the, the one sl card slot for the Sony A9s because I've never, ever had a card that's failed on me. But now that I've got it, I don't know, I just think oh, it, it is a peace of mind, I suppose. So it's interesting how you can change your mind once you're using it. I mean, clearly the Nikon cameras that I used to use are D4S and those cameras used to all have dual slots. Um, so, you know, that, that's, it's, it's interesting. But the thing that I have found is I've looked at the JPEG results from the shoot I just did down the beach the other day, and the JPEGs out of that camera are beautiful. Um, so they are really, really amazing looking uh, files. So I may even look at one day, I might even start to shoot sometimes JPEG because they do tend to look gorgeous. Uh, coming out of the A9, I think they're much better than what I'd seen with the other Sony cameras. The colour of the skin tones and things like that are just beautiful. But I'm going to have to do some testing on that. Obviously, I'm not going to do it in a live wedding. But the, the beauty is if I'm shooting JPEG to one and then RAW to the other, I could just use the JPEGs and then if there was an issue, I could then go back to the RAWs. So I have got that uh, ability of going between both. But I will do some testing over the next few weeks and I'll let you know about how that actually goes. Um, so that's my feeling that, you know, they are going to have to make this camera completely different to um, the A9. They, they can't, well, we call it here in Australia, bastardise it. They can't copy the A9 completely and then sell it for a much lower price. Um, Sony would be silly to do that, so they do have to make it quite a bit different. If they're putting the same autofocus in the A7 III, if they're putting the same sensor in the A7 III, it's going to have to be different. Um, I do also think that probably because the A7 III will be slower, and it may be much slower, um, they will then be able to uh, go more on the quality and the dynamic range because clearly the A9 is the dynamic range and everything is tailored for that sport shooting and shooting at high ISOs. So you might find that you gain back the dynamic range in the A7 III uh, and that will be better as well. But I, do, I don't think the dual card slots will be there. Um, Chad said, I look at the second slot as an insurance policy, a.k.a. just in case shit happens. Yeah, and I can understand that, Chad. Like I said, I've never ha ever had it happen to me. Um, but, you know, it, I suppose there is always a possibility. Um, and Tag the Shooter said, why do you use JPEGs? Well, I, do I don't at the moment. They're only there as a... I always shoot raw. Um, but I have noticed that when I've looked at the JPEGs, because I've been shooting them at the same time, the JPEGs are gorgeous. And sometimes it's taken me a little bit of time to match those JPEGs um, to the raw, the raw to the JPEGs because the JPEG 
processing in the new A9 is so good. Sony really have lifted their game with the new A9. That JPEG conversion, whatever they're doing inside that JPEG is beautiful. If you look at DPR review of the A9, that they've just done an updated uh, review of it. They talk about the JPEG actually being so good in that camera. And they are, they're outstanding. The color is beautiful, the sharpening's beautiful. Um, but again, if I'm shooting RAW on the A9, as well as JPEG, I've got the best of both worlds. So I can, if I wanted to, just bring the, the JPEGs in and then I could just use the RAW in case if there was a problem. The issue for me too is, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this later on, is editing time. Um, that Lightroom for me, even though I've got a Mac Pro and I've got a beast of a computer with dual graphic cards and everything else, Lightroom is slow. And anything that I can do at the moment when I'm shooting a lots and lots of weddings to, to speed up that workflow is gonna be better for me. Um, so if I was able to work in JPEG, uh, it, it will, you know, save me a lot, of, a lot of time. So, like I said, though, if I did want to go back and edit something, like if something was way underexposed and I did want to pull that back, I could go to the raw files, which because it's shooting raw and JPEG at the same time, I've always got that back up as well. Um, but at this stage, I'm only sort of discussing that with you guys. I'm not sure that's the way I'm going to go. I'm just looking into it. So, you know, I'll let you know how I go a little bit later on. Um, Take the Shooter said, uh, the only time I had a card fail is trying to put a card in the small space of the A6300 uh, and A6500 and damage the sliding locking piece. Yeah, that, it is very tight in the A6500 and they, I always have trouble getting them out. Uh, so it is hard. Chad said, I'm a Fujifilm shooter, thinking of going back to full frame. I want to stick with mirrorless. Is there anything I should worry about with the A7R2? I shoot portrait and wildlife. No, Chad, there's not. The A7R2 is an amazing camera. That's why I'm not selling mine. Um, I'm keeping my A7R2 as well as my A9. Um, the dynamic range is still better in the A7R2, and also the ISO is is uh, a little bit better um, down low in low um, ISO, say, you know, 100 ISO at the native ISO is better for the A7R2, and just detail alone is so much better. Because I do so much fashion, and portrait type work, and I'm retouching a lot, to have that resolution is a big thing for me. So if I'm shooting portraits in a studio situation, I'm still gonna be using my uh, A7R2. Check out um, Frank Dorhoff. He's just done a, a good review of the A9 as well. I'll see if I can find it. Uh, he's on YouTube. Um, let me just bring up um, my YouTube history and I'll just see if I can find it for you. Because, yeah, I can't. It's, well, it's not there. I could find it. But, it, yeah, do look up Frank Dorhoff. I'll see if I can find. I'll put the link down below. Um, because I, he's just reviewed it. He just went from England. He's a high fashion photographer. He just went over to the UK and Sony lent him a, a Sony A9. And he said the same thing, that he was going to keep the Sony A7R2 for his portrait work because he needs that detail when he enlarges to retouch. If you are into high-end retouching, clearly... Um, you know, that's what you should probably be doing is, is getting something that has more megapixels. So yeah, Chad, I'd definitely get the A7R2. Even the A7 III is only gonna be still be 24 megapixel. Um, so if you really want the utmost quality, I'd be getting the A7R2 now or wait for the, say the A9R, something like that. But you can't go wrong with the A7 III. That camera is still gonna be relevant for a long, long time. It's an amazing camera. Um, so I wouldn't wait for the A7 III, no, Chad. I'll, if, you, if you're ready to go now, I'd get an A7R II. And they're good prices at the moment. They've actually come down quite a bit. Um, so that's my thinking. So let me know in, in what you're thinking down below, whether you think um, that, you know, you you think the A9 will be completely different. Oh, Delta Dave, thank you so much. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so let me know whether you think that you're going to go for the A7R III, well, the A7 III whether you think there is gonna be that difference, what you think the rumors are gonna be. I don't, like I said, I don't think there's gonna be a dual card slots in the A7 III. I think that's gonna be the big difference between the, the two of them. I think you'll probably still find the joystick will be there, um, but I think that's gonna be the big thing. And obviously the um, tracking and probably the, um, the 20 frames per second. Um, so that's what I, I'm thinking anyway. Now clearly there's not gonna be an A7R um, three or an A9R or an A9S this year, because they're saying this is gonna be released uh, in October, November, I think. So I think this probably won't be released until right at the end of the year, could be even early next year. Um, so you're still a way off getting this camera yet. Um, so just, just 
hang on and wait. But uh, like I said to Shad, if, if you're thinking about getting the A7R2, I wouldn't hesitate. I'd buy another one tomorrow if I needed it. Uh, it's just an amazing, amazing camera. Great video. It's got S-Log built in. The focus is good enough. Uh, I mean, it's not the A9R, but it, uh, A9, but it's 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 still amazing in how it works. So it's a great overall camera, and I love my A7R2. I'm still going to be using it in the studio. So they're the rumours, um, and they're saying that the, there's no announcements yet for the AR3 or the A7S3. We're still waiting for Sony to release. Hopefully, they're going to release the S-Log for the A9. I'm still hanging on for it, but hopefully they'll do it. Now, talking about that, the updates that came out the other day, I did update the A7S2s because I've got two of those. I updated the A6300, the A9, and also the A7R2 with the new firmware. Everything went really, really well. With that, and I've noticed with all the cameras that they do tend to um, start up a little bit faster. Um, the thing that I mostly love about it is the fact that I can now rename every single camera. Because I'm using multiple cameras, it used to be a pain, and I was always terrified of them overwriting other um, files. I don't have to worry about that anymore because they're named after each camera. So I've called one camera A7-1, uh, and then I've called another one A7-2, uh, and then it's got another one where I've called my A9, A, A9D for David. Uh, the A6500 has its own name, etc. So that, to me, is something I've been wanting from Sony for so long, and they finally released it. So it, it's been an amazing thing that they've actually done that. Um, so that's one thing that I can say I'd just upgrade the firmware alone just for that feature. Um, so anyway, I've upgraded to all the firmwares, didn't have any issues at all. Um, let me just check some more questions. Um, Chad said... Um, Off-topic question, do you know how the 85 1.8 FE is compared to the Zeiss? Well, I actually discussed that last week, Chad. You might be able to go back and have a look at my last live talk. But um, the results from that uh, is that it's an incredibly good lens. I think that's almost the same as the Battis. It's It's pretty well close to it. The only difference, I think, between that and the Battis is that it doesn't have the weather sealing or the stabilisation, which which for me matters because I'm shooting a lot of video now, and the uh, stabilisation in the lens actually does matter a little bit to me. Plus, it has the, um, stab uh, the weather sealing because I know the um, Sony one isn't weather sealed. There's another issue, though. The 85 1.8 will do the 20 frames per second if you get the A9. The Battis will only do 15. So if that is an issue, it could be. If you want the extra five frames, it, it could be an issue. Um, I love the Battis, though. I mean, I adore that lens. But probably if I was buying a new lens now, I'd probably buy the Sony because it's so cheap. And what is it, $600, I think? It's half the price, I think, of the Battis. So... Um, I'd probably be buying the Sony now if, if I was buying any lens, I'd be getting the 1.8. Uh, the G Master is too big for me. Um, I'm not interested in carrying around that weight anymore. Um, and I'm happy with a 1.8 aperture. So um, that's the only issue for me. So I've, I've sort of stayed with the lighter lenses because I want to run and gun type shoot and, and not be lugging around this heavy gear anymore. Um, so yeah, so I'd probably buy the 1.8. Um, Tag the Shooter said, I think the A7 III will not have dual slot or joystick. I think the A7 III will just have be a full frame A6500. And, and you could be right. I'm not sure. Well, they're saying on this Sony Alpha rumors that it's going to have the joystick. But again, it is only rumors. Uh, but like I said, I definitely don't think that it's going to have the... Um, uh, the dual card slots. So that's going to be the big telling factor. They're going to say, if you want those dual card slots, you've got to go to the A9 series. Um, and that, that's how I think it would it's going to happen. So that's that story. So you can have a look. And I'll put all these links uh, in the um, box down below. So uh, you can look at those once this uh, is uploaded. I haven't got them there yet. Um, but I'll stick them down a little bit below. Um, there's another thing here too that I thought that I'd share this with you because this was an interesting article. It's the Ben Zier's. Um, this guy was um, a Nikon shooter like me or Nikon. Um, he was using D4Ss or D5s, I think. Um, and he's now saying that he's converting to Sony. Now he's actually getting the A9s. Uh, so there's a whole um, story that... Oh, thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm getting these donations. I really appreciate that, guys. Um, this, the Benzies, well, he's got a whole discussion on his page that you can look at. And he's gone through the whole thing about why he's gone from the D5 to the D9, uh, to the A9. 
um, and it's a really good discussion that you can watch. Now, this is a whole video, so I'm not gonna play it. You can go on yourselves later. Uh, I'll share this, like I said, um, down below so that you can actually see it. Um, but it's a really good discussion about how he found shooting with the A9 as against using the D4Ss. Remember, I can relate to this because I came from Nikon myself. Um, so I can relate to what he's actually saying. I was using D4Ss though in the D810s. Um, I didn't have the D5. Uh, but yeah, have a read of, have a look at that, and it's it's actually a really really good review. Um, and again, like I said, I'll, I'll put that link there as well if you're thinking about how it goes. And he sort of discusses the rolling shutter and ISO and focusing uh, things like that. So you can have a look at that too. Um, and we'll, um, like I said, put some questions down below and let me know. Uh, yeah, and guys too, if you can, just please give it a like because we'll get more people in here if you can. Uh, like Michael's in the house now. Um, we've got a few people in. We've got Stacks actually watching now, which has been so good. Now, there is one downside to um, the, the Sony firmware upgrade, and I'm hoping that they do fix this. That they're saying that the Star Eater hasn't been fixed with this new firmware, because I know there was a link saying that it was meant to have improved this, but according to this article, there's a few people now doing the shooting, and they're saying that it hasn't um, helped uh, at all and it's still smoothing out the stars. It's something about the, the noise reduction or something when you go past, I think it's three seconds or something, but um, the, it causes an issue. And I said, like, I had an issue with this when I was in New Zealand. Uh, the, I went 12 months ago and the images out of my a, A7R2 were incredible of the um, night photography because New Zealand actually has the darkest sky in the world. It's actually rated the best place in the world to shoot stars. Um, and there's one point particularly where you go that is just incredible and it's, it's unbelievable how many stars you can see. Well, the year before I went and it was gorgeous, this year when I went, uh, I thought there was something wrong, that I was doing something different. And, it was, and obviously when I got back, I found out about the star eating issue and, and that's what it was. So Sony haven't fixed that yet. So clearly it's something in the firmware because originally when I was using my A7R2, um, it was fine. So they, you obviously can do it. Um, so Sony still have to look at that. So if you are into this star shooting, guys, um, it's still an issue apparently with the new firmware. Um, so I'm just hoping that Sony will actually fix that. Um, Tag the Shooter said, did you do the unlimited video recording on any of your cameras? Yes, and I've done that on all of them. Um, I run that now on all my cameras. I don't um, have that the time limit on, on any of them now. Obviously, I can't do it on the A9, um, but I, I've got it on all my other cameras, so they never shut off, um, which is great. That hack is fantastic. I mean, <laughs> that's one thing. I just I hope that they bring out one for the A9. Um, so I'm really hoping that happens. Um, the other thing too is I've like a shot with the A9 the other day. I'm not sure whether you looked at the forest video that I did. That was only a quick shoot that I did. I just went out for the day into the forest uh, down here at the Great Ocean Road. Um, the video outside of that uh, A9 is, is incredible from what I've looked at. Um, if I spent more time doing it, I'm sure that the video on that is gonna look nicer than the A7R2 or the A6500. Um, it's, it's incredibly sharp. The, the, I had an issue on the day though, I wanted to use a gimbal, but the camera with the, I used the 35 1.4 lens on it and it was too heavy for that gimbal. Um, so I was trying to handhold it and, and it made the footage a little bit unsteady. So if you do watch it and the footage is jumping a bit or whatever, it's because I had to use stabilization in Final Cut. That's the reason why that footage looks a, a little bit jumpy in a couple of spots. Uh, but it, it worked amazingly. Um, Mark, Mark has said, how do you do the hack? There's a hack, if you, if you Google, someone else may be able to put up the link on here Merka, there's a link that you can um, just go to and you attach your computer, uh, your uh, camera to the um, computer, download this hack and it puts a hack onto your computer, onto your um, camera, but it has to have the Play Memories app installed. So that's why you can't do it with the A9. Um, so if you Google um, Play Memories um, camera app hack or something like that, you'll find it uh, and then you'll be able to put that on. Um, Chad said, what is the highest ISO on the A7R2 that you would go uh, for a usable image. Um, I've, I confidently go up to 6400, Chad. Uh, but that's me, but you have to expose correctly. If you don't expose correctly, it will be noisy. But if you expose correctly, 
uh, in the camera, I'm quite comfortable going up to 6,400. Um, you probably could push it higher than that, but I don't. Uh, that, that's the sort of range that I'll go up to with the, uh, the A7R2. Um, Tag the Shooter said, uh, that one camera guy just did a video on YouTube. Oh yeah, he did, yeah. If you check the one camera guy, Merka, he did a, uh, a video on it. So if you go to his channel, you'll actually see that he's, he shows how to do it. So he's got that actually on there. Um, it, it's a great hack. And I, like I said, that's one thing with the A9 I'm spewing. They've taken out that Play Memories app. Oh, spewing too, it means upset. <laughs> it's Australian slang. Um, so that's that's something I hope they can fix with the firmware uh, a little bit later on. They've got to fix this star reading firmware because it is really not good at this stage. They actually do need to, to solve that. Um, now another thing too that I wanted to sort of discuss with you too was this is an interesting article that I get a lot of questions asked for me about uh, the difference between using APS-C and um, full frame cameras. And there's an article on Digital Photography School uh, that again I'll, I'll put in the links but it goes through the whole differences of using um, cropped sensors against full frame sensors so you'll be able to have a look at this article and it's actually a very very good article uh, and it talks all about the differences in ISO performance uh, it takes you through relating it to bigger buckets this is the APS-C on this side 24 buckets is against 24 larger buckets on the full frame that there's more data there and then it takes you through examples of ISO and how it affects color. Um, you can sort of see they'll show they show bits about how it, it, the color is different, and the cropping sizes are mentioned down here. Like this is your iPhone, uh, this is Micro Four Thirds, like your um, Olympuses. Uh, this is the crop sensor, like your Fuji and your Sony's, and this is your full frame. Uh, sensors through here uh, and then it goes through talking about uh, oh that's just frame size there that's APS-C size and this is your full frame sensor size um, through here uh, and lens sizes it takes you through the whole lot so have a look at this um, and see how what you guys think of it but the main difference really that I found between the two and I like I said I use the A6500 an awful lot the video that I just posted yesterday was shot with the A6500 so if you're looking at that where I just did some a, a girl sitting on um, some suitcases that was with the A6500 now I deliberately shoot with different cameras for you guys so that I can show you how the results work in real life uh, I mean if if I didn't have this YouTube channel or whatever, I probably would have shot that shot yesterday with the A7R2, but I'm confident enough with the A6500 that I use that now in shooting all the time and also in weddings because the images are beautiful. I have multiple gear, so I've got the benefit of being able to, to choose something for the day that I think I'll be able to share to you guys to show how it works. So the, the main thing that I've found between the two of them is that the obviously the full frame has better depth of field. So if you are trying to isolate the background more, you, you can't beat the full frame. If you're working in really low light scenario, you can't beat the full frame. So there are issues where you would always go to a full frame sensor rather than having an APS-C sensor. Um, but again, if you use very, very long lenses, well, it becomes a little bit mute anyway because if you're using a 70 to 200, you're still gonna have that beautiful out of focus background anyway. So it just depends what you're actually after. But they're the main differences that um, I, I've seen um, you know, between the two. And I'm quite comfortable using APS-C as against full frame. And I use full frame lenses on APS-C cameras. So I'm, I'm using the full frame lenses all the time on the A6500. Um, so have a think about that, read that article and then let me know what you think about it. I know quite a few of you will have the A6500 or the A6300, I mean obviously there's even a Fuji shooter in here, Chad. Um, the main difference for me though is the depth of field and the noise, they're the main difference that I can get between the two. Um, so I'll put this article in and you can have a read um, of that as well and it's got some really good examples um, and how it affects you doing your shooting and things like that. So. Um, it's a great article, and that's with DP. That's from um, Digital Photography School. Let me just check some um, questions in here. SP DTL, uh, loving your work. I've watched a few of your videos, mate. They've been really good. I've been enjoying it uh, and been enjoying your English accent. <laughs> um, so have a look at his videos too, guys. They're, they're really good. Um, tag the shooter photography. I oh, just said thanks. Um, 
He said he's trying to get as good as me. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, Delta Dave said, I think the difference between full frame and APS-C has narrowed to the point that it's almost nil. And yeah, you know what? They are getting close. It's still depth of field, though, Delta Dave. That, that's the difference. I can still tell if I'm, if I'm shooting, say, my A7R2 as against, even my A7Ts as against the A6500. Uh, but you know what? The results I'm getting from the A6500 are stunning. That camera is incredible. Um, so if, if that's all you can afford or that's all you want to go down, I wouldn't hesitate in getting that camera. That's why I show it to you guys. Like I said, I, being a full-time professional photographer, I would always end up using the, the highest end gear that I had. But because I want to show you how this stuff works in real life, that's why I, I shoot these other cameras. And that's why um, I sh showed you that uh, result the other day. And that was using the Profoto high-end uh, flash gear. So, you know... Uh, it, it's all working. Uh, Carl said, full frame lenses look better on full frame sensor and have the correct field of view. Well, I don't know, Carl. Look, to be honest, I can't tell the difference. I, I've shot using both, and I, I honestly, and I even use the APS C lenses on the full frame. It does go to 35 um, sensor size, uh, but, or crop size, but I don't know. Look, I can't tell the difference, and uh, unless you want to pixel peep it, I just can't tell the difference. Uh, that that's from me personally. So have a look at that uh, article there. That's a great one. And the other thing too, I wanted to talk to you about this because I wanted to get some of your opinions about um, this, which is Petapixel have put this article on about cutting your um, editing time down in half. Now, I don't know whether you guys are finding that um, Lightroom is, is getting slower and slower and slower. Well, it is definitely for me. I think every update that comes through, it, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm just wondering how it's going to handle these 60 megabyte files that, you know, the new A7R3 or whatever is going to have. Uh, I think it's going to come to a grinding halt. Um, so we're going to talk through this article uh, as well. Just let me check a couple of questions. Chad Smith said, depth of field is the main reason I'm switching back to full frame. And I can understand that, Chad. Yep. Um, Take the Shooter said, David, how do you store and share your images after wedding to your clients? What site do you use? I don't use any. Um, all I do, I've got um, two Pegasus drives. Uh, I'll show you, I'll bring it up and show you what I'm using. I'll see if I can get it. Is that a Pegasus one there? Oh no, it's Promise, sorry. I'm using Promise for So this is the drive that I'm using. Um, I'm just waiting for it to open up. This is the drive that I'm using. It's got four separate drives. Um, I've got four gigabyte drives in each one and I've got two of these. Um, I've got two of these uh, they're fire wired together, so they just daisy chain off each other. Um, so I'm running two of these, and one backs up the other. So basically, I'm, I've got complete backups of um, from one to the other. So these are in RAID zero. Now, normally you wouldn't run in RAID zero because if one drive fails, they or you, you lose the whole lot. But I've got them basically going from one drive to the next. So it's very very fast, and I've got that redundancy in case if if something happens. They're incredibly qu quick working in RAID 0. So this is what I'm using. So when I do the, um, when I bring the files in, they go onto a folder on the RAID, which just shows up on the desktop. Then that automatically backs up to the second um, Promise drive uh, later that day. Also what I do then is I also buy portable hard drives and I save them onto a portable hard drive and I give them to my wife to take to work. Um, because you should have off-site storage as well. Uh, and I won't delete the cards off the camera until those three things have been done, until it's put on the, the main drive, backed up to the second, and until my wife brings that backup drive in to here, and then I back it up to that, and then she takes it home. Now, I've actually... Um, I've, I keep the files officially in my contracts for six months. Now, when I deliver them to the clients, I give them to them as JPEGs, 
um, and I save them to a USB drive and give them to them on a USB drive. Uh, and I'll talk about my whole workflow and one of the other things because I want to go through that how that all works with you later on. But um, So I save them as JPEGs. Uh, now they are resized to 8x12 because I want them to come back to me to get large prints. And this is all written in my contract. Um, so they're sized to 8x12. So if they go any larger than that, they know that the quality is going to suffer. So that's what they get on discs. Now I do save them for six months, but I've never got rid of anything yet. But I may have to one day. Uh, but in my contract, it says I will hold them for six months. Um, now, someone's saying try and use ACR instead of Lightroom. Yeah, and I probably could try that, Carl. I haven't used that yet. Um, uh, Omar says, will Sony have AIF with the upcoming um, Samyang 35? I don't know. Well, it'll be interesting to see whether that is the case. Uh, I'm... I'm Hopefully it will, otherwise I wouldn't be buying it. I, that's the reason why I only stay with native lenses for everything, because I want all the features to work, and I haven't gone outside that yet, Omar. Um, Chris Smith said, I'm a bo uh, Boca junkie, or Boca, I always <laughs> get confused. Um, and I always shoot wide open too, Chad, and that's why, yeah, you need to go full frame. Mavfan said, although, Chad, I'll tell you what, if you get that 24, 1.8 Sony lens, the, the Boca on that is gorgeous on the A6500, stunning. Um, Mavfan said Lightroom is slow to import, but once I'm working on a file, I don't have any issue. And yeah, once you're working on it, it's fine. It's just taking longer and longer to import though. It's, it's taken me forever. Um, Chad said, I'm having the same issue with Lightroom. Uh, on one is making some great updates. I've got the on one, um, suite as well. Um, that's this program, uh, on one raw, I think it is, um, and it does seem to have some really good, it does seem to have some really, really good features. Um, but again, I'm not using this yet. I'm just using it for some editing features. But uh, I have got the On One Photo Raw, uh, yeah, which I purchased. So I have got that, um, Chad or Carl. Um, Carl said the IAF works well using the Samyang. Well, there you go. So it does work with it. And that's a really good cheap small lens. Um, I love my 20, uh, the 35 2.8 for travel. That's a great lens. It's very, very small. It's fast. It's beautiful. It's super sharp. So I'll be interested to see how it, it works. Uh, Delta Dave said it kills me to pay for Lightroom now that I'm using Capture One all the time. <laughs> um, so let's go through this and what these people are saying. They're saying in here that the I've heard of a lot of people saying photo mechanic is, is meant to be very, very good. But I have heard from somewhere the other day that it struggled with the A9, the 20 frames per second. It struggled with keeping up with that. Um, so it's we'll have to see what people say about that and how it's working. I know a lot of people will do an initial cull with something like photo mechanic and then take it into Lightroom later on. Because apparently the previews read much, much faster. Um, so there's that. There's also XN View and PF Fixer and VSCO keys. They're separate things that they're recommending that you can actually do. Um, and I think Windows has a XN View is free alternative as well. So it's this one down here, which is this XN View. Um, that one is free if you're on Windows. So one day I might try it. I know Photo Mechanic you've got to actually purchase. Um, so let me know if anyone's using... Um, Photo Mechanic at all, guys, because I'd be interested to know whether you guys use Photo Mechanic and whether you've found that that helps. Um, so this is an article talking all about that. Um, so I'll leave the, um, I'll leave, like I said, this in the description down below as well. And, and you can let me know if any of you are using it and how you found it is against Lightroom. What's he making me hesitate to move from Lightroom is the cataloging feature of Lightroom. It's so good. Um, and I'm not sure how these other programs work with the cataloging uh, as against that. Because I do so much work, and I've always got to be able to go back and, and get what I need. Uh, I want everything, everything in one nice organized place. Lightroom seems to work really, really well like that. But clearly, they've got to start thinking about rewriting that program. Um, so that's, that's all I'm going to show you in news. Now, I wanted to go to um, show you what's in my bag for today because I've got something different to show you. <clears throat> because as you know, I, I do do an awful lot of flash work, and but a lot of my work as well, particularly weddings and stuff like that, uh, where I'm doing the bride and uh, the wedding reception and stuff like that, where I want quite moody lighting, 
uh, is often done with continuous light. So I thought I'd talk to you about the continuous light systems that I use, um, and you can sort of give me some um, of your feelings about you know what you use. So I'll start off by showing the first one that I use, and that's this, which is the ice light. Um, obviously, everything I buy, I try and buy barn doors, because the reason why I like the barn doors is because... Um, you've got control about where the light goes. So, you know, I mean, I can sort of stop it from spilling out the sides or, or what I want to do. So th this is the one of the main lights that I actually use. Now, I've got three of these that I have um, that I like. They always come with the, you know, your, your mounting point underneath here. They're very easy to control with your dials on the back uh, for power and also color. The main thing I like about this one is I can balance the colour on this. Um, it, it's really quite accurate and it doesn't tend to flick them at all when I'm using it for video or still. So I've got some really, really good results from this. So that, that's the first type of light that I use, which is the, uh, these are the um, Neo Roto lights. Um, I can't remember the cost. I think they're around about $300 or something each or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but that's, that's the first type of light that I use. The, the next type of light that I use is this one, which is, this is an aperture one. Um, this one is the HR672C. And again, this has the control of the, um, of the intensity and your color as well. You can run this from batteries or AC. The same with the uh, Neo Rotor light, you can run from AC or batteries as well. Uh, they take six batteries. Um, this takes the, the larger Sony type batteries on the back of this one. Um, I don't run it much on batteries, I tend to run them on AC, but um, that's another good thing. It's got a diffuser panel on the front here, uh, but there's no barn doors with this, so it can be an issue with spilling of light uh, and stuff like that. So that's another light source that I have. And I've got a smaller version of this too, which is great because you can stick it behind things like rings, hide it away, and then use the light to come in. Um, the third type of light that I've got is the, uh, the ice light. Now I've got three of these ice lights. The only problem with this is you can't do color balance on it or change the color temperature. So I've bought from a, the camera shop just some yellow, uh, the correcting gel, uh, correct, correcting film, and I just, that's why I use these rubber bands. I just tape, just put it in between the rubber bands and I can then get the correct color. Um, out of the three of them, uh, this is my favorite. Uh, this is gorgeous. The light that you get from this is so close to window light that it's not funny. Uh, it, it sort of has this diffusion panel on the front and, you know, the light is really, really soft. I don't know whether these batteries are... Yeah. Um, you've got a control here for going up and down in power. But the great thing is that, you know, you can move this sort of around to where you want it to go, anywhere that you'd like, um, you know, and bring it out. And I found it's, it's, it's incredibly soft, beautiful window light. The other advantage too is they can be screwed together. So because I've got the three of these, I can screw three of these together and you can do a whole body in one go. So it's like this massive light bank that's, that's um, long down below. And I've also got barn doors that fit around this as well. So they can be controlled as well. Um, I've moved more and more into continuous lighting with my work. Um, and because the Sonys particularly have such high ISO ratings on them, you, basically what you see is what you get. So it's gorgeous. And I use these outside at night um, rather than using flash, things like that. The only issue is if you try and get too close, you get issues with the iris closing. And that's one of the problems, I suppose, that they can be quite bright and you can, the, uh, you know, your talent can start to squeeze their eyes and squint a little bit. So you have to be careful in that respect. But I love the aspect of seeing what you get in camera. And that's one benefit of going to this continuous light as against going um, with the flash. Um, but you do have to get much closer to the, the subject, obviously. So if you were trying to get environmental, you have to move uh, closer, you'd have to then use flash if you want to shoot more environmental. So I thought I'd show you those. Um, let me just see what's up here. Um, 
BMC P said, David, will you consider buying the A7R3? I'm stunned by my own A7R2 picture quality and will wear it out before another high megapixel purchase. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, whether I'll upgrade. Um, I'm not, yeah, just let me hide this for a second. Yeah, I'm not sure whether I'll upgrade it for a while. I'm still, I'm still adore my A7R3. Um, there'd have to be a reason for me to want to go up in megapixel. If it's 60 megapixel, I don't know how my gear is probably going to cope with that file size. So I'm not sure. I'll have to assess that at the time. But I'm, I'm so happy with my A7R2. And I, yeah, like you, I'm just going to wear that out. I'm not, never going to sell that camera. Chad said, um, since I switched to mirrorless Fujifilm, I really like seeing the actual image as I press the shutter. I know, it, it's just a game changer. Because I came from Nikon, Chad, uh, the difference of seeing it in camera is, is just a game. I, I just can't say how much of an advantage that is, that when I'm shooting, I don't have to chimp. Um, and brides always say to me, they're amazed at how quickly I work and I'm not just blazing away, that I do sort of work slowly, but it's because I'm not having to chimp all the time. I, I see it in the camera, I know exactly what I'm gonna get. Um, so yeah, that's that. So let's have a look now at a shoot. So I'm gonna take you through um, the shoot and discuss this with you. Let me just open up um, this desk scribble so I can do some drawing for you. Um, so this image here, what I tried to do, this was a shoot that I did in the forest. I shared this a while ago, but I thought I could take you through it um, and sort of show you how I'm actually working. Um, I'm using the A7R 3 I think, here. Um, but you can sort of see that when I do a shoot, a lot of the time I've got to imagine the environment that I'm working in, that I've got to imagine how it's going to be when it's processed sometimes, because this was shot in midday. This was I had to do it at this time during this, this day. Uh, it, it was a reasonable trip to get to this spot. So I had to visualize what the image would look like when it was done. And you can see I've got an assistant here holding the, the flash. Um, it's just got a, a uh, like a portable beauty dish that sits, over, well, it's actually an octa grid that sits here, uh, you know, and that's lighting up. Um, the model um, through this area through here. So I'm exposing for that, deliberately making it quite dark. Um, now you're seeing this as the behind the scenes, so this has been lighter than what I actually shot it. Um, so I've shot this deliberately under um, when um, I've taken this shot, knowing what I'm going to bring back later on uh, with this result. You can sort of see that I've got her holding this um, lantern that she's got down here. Um, and basically what it will end up like is this. So that's, that's how the image would sort of look if you're looking at it in real life. And then this is the image uh, after I've processed it later on. Um, so you can see that um, the light coming through here is lit from her, uh, from the flash. All of this area is lit from the flash. Uh, I've clearly added in the um, the light in the uh, in the lantern there, but basically what I've done here is I've overpowered the sun. So because I've overpowered the sun, it's still giving me that beautiful sort of shadow range that you can sort of see in her face through here. So it's given her shape, and it's made the image a little bit more dynamic, and it's taken away all of the sun in this background area uh, as well, and it brought that back inside the the actual image so you can sort of see how it's gone from you know this type of scenario um to to this type of scenario <clears throat> let me just check what some people are saying here delta dave does the neo run on batteries yes it just runs on triple uh, double a um delta dave <clears throat> again if we're looking at um this image here um, you can sort of see again that the flash is again over in this area, over in this corner over here, and it's lighting her up through here when it's flashed. Um, again, I've exposed to drop down the ambient, um, and I'm then going to overpower the sun and then bring the image in uh, a little bit later on um, to, to look sort of a bit moody. And you can sort of see that basically that's the, a similar type effect that I'm looking at. So that's one editing that I've done. Um, this one here is another uh, version of the same image. So it just depends on, sometimes I'll do two separate versions because I'm not quite certain about 
um, how I want the image to actually look. Um, I do like, and th this is sort of my game, my style, guys. It's very dark and moody, and that's that's the type of thing that I love to shoot. Uh, and it's it's the way that I always tend to see things. I'll always sort of see things from a moody aspect. Um, so it you know it sort of works out that way. Um, another one here, you can sort of see this time I'm I'm coming from this side. Now the reason why I wanted to do this was because um, I wanted to make it look like there's light streaming in from this side coming in through here. So I wanted to do that. So I had to draw that later on in Photoshop. Um, again, you can sort of see the flashes in this area here. So that's sort of going to light her up through this area through here. And then if we look at the image when it's done, um, it's here. Again, it's got that moody, um, the shutter speed was 1 250th um, Delta Day for that. I had to, at this stage, I was using Pro Photo, um, and they didn't have HSS for um, the Pro Photo. They have now, um, but b because I needed to keep it under that shutter speed, I had to stay within the native uh, sync speed of the camera, so it was 1 to, uh, 250th. Now it's not an issue because you've got that now. And you can see how, again, I'll show you back to here, that I wanted to have that light that was sort of streaming in through this area coming through here. Um, and I saw that when I looked at it. Like I said, you've got to visualize what you're looking at. Um, I tend to think of myself, and this is what I tell clients, I tend to think of myself as an artist. And for me, I mean, often I will get exactly as you see it in the camera. If it's a wedding and stuff like that, a lot of the images are as you see it. But when I'm doing these sort of shots, uh, it becomes more about art for me. Um, so, you know, and that's, that's how you'll sort of see um, how the light is sort of streaming in through those these areas that I've, I've made through here. And you can see that she's lit from that side with the flash. So that's giving her that shape. The shadow is very dark on this side. Uh, so it's given her that shape. I was, uh, Chad, I'm using a Profoto B1 here and it wasn't HSS at that stage, no, because uh, Profoto didn't have HSS then. They have now with a new Sony Air Remote, but they didn't then. Um, so that's how that works. Uh, and then I'll take you through some of the other stuff though that's not so artistic. Well, I'll take you through another one first just so you can sort of see. Um, again, this was still that type of scenario that I wanted that fairy in the forest sort of gamey throne type look. Um, and again, I'm using um, the flashes over here and it's gonna light her up on this side. So it's gonna give her shape there and it's gonna go reasonably dark through here. And again, I'm gonna overpower all this ambience, so this is all gonna become dark. Again, I'm using 1 800th of a second here though, um, and I'm on ISO 1000 um, for this shot. Oh no, this is, this is the behind the scenes, that's why. Let me go back, because I better check what shutter speed that was. Yeah, it was 1 250th, yeah. Um, now, if we then see the final result, um, it's here. So you can see there's two versions of this that I've done. That's the first one, and then that's the second one. And, oh, what I did was, I should explain that, I decided to end up putting the flash over the other side. So, yeah, the flash ended up going over this side. That's why she's lit from this side um, as against the other one. Um, and so you can sort of see that that um, is there. No, I didn't use an ND Delta Dave. I don't use them anymore. Look, I have got them. Um, but I didn't use them. I just stayed within the shutter uh, sync speed. I might have in the beach later on. I'm not sure. We'll check because we'll see the shutter speed there. <coughs> so there are two versions of that that I've done. I've done that version and also that version. Sometimes I can't make up my mind about um, which way that I um, wanted to go. I just wanted to show these because these were taken with the A6500. Uh, the, and basically... Um, A6300 actually, and, and this is where this camera excels, and obviously I'll, I'll be using the A9 now, but this excels because it can capture them running in between. I just had this on um, the fast shutter, so it was doing eight frames or whatever it does per second, and I could capture them right in midair. Um, now this was 1 32,000th of a second, um, f5.6. Now I didn't use autofocus with this though because I wanted to make sure that I did nail it. So what I did was, I pre-focused, so what I did, I made the mark on the sand here, 
set the focus to there, and then I went to manual. That way I knew I didn't have to worry about them getting out of focus or the camera even tracking them. The second I saw them coming into the screen, I fired away. Um, so I got multiple shots of them jumping uh, and doing it that way. So the, yeah, this was just with the um, A6300, um, which again, you know, it's a beautiful result. They don't let anyone tell you you can't get good results uh, from these, um, the Sony A6500. Again, another one here. There's another one here that uh, she's jumping. Um, so there's a few there that I've done that I've captured that motion with them um, in the in the air. Now, I then wanted to show you how I've used um, a reflector because I, I do use reflectors as well. These shots were all done using a reflector. So basically, what I wanted to do was sit them down. I wanted to try and get some of this beautiful foliage. Now this was shot at 16400 uh, and it's f2. I wanted to shoot low and that's I do always like to shoot um, wide open. So that's why you're getting this lovely out of focus. This was shot with the Batis and it's nailed her eye focus on her eye there. Um, and again, the thing is, I had a reflector, which was over this area, shining the light back over to this sort of section of her face through here to give her that nice, beautiful look. Um, so I do use reflectors as well. Um, and, and it's worked beautifully in this, in this case. Um, you can look at a couple, they're all pretty similar because they're all the same type of lighting that's being used. Um, Again, if we're looking at some other ones that have just been done, uh, it gives you an idea of that lovely out of focus. So even though this is shot in really, really harsh conditions, you can sort of see it because the, the shadows are reasonably hard um, through here. I mean, I could spend some time softening those off, but I'm happy with how these results look and the clients adored them. Um, but it's it's beautiful lighting just with, with a reflector. Um, again, uh, if we look through here, you can sort of see some others that have actually been shot. Uh, it's just stunning, beautiful lighting that you can get by using uh, a reflector in sunlight and using a, a wide open aperture. Now, this is going to be, the sun actually was, um, it was pretty high. Uh, it, the sun was up here. The sun was really, really high sort of coming behind. You can sort of see that it's kissing the, the thing here, sort of behind. So it was sort of coming a little bit behind, wrapping a little bit around the face, but I wanted more fill, and I wanted a little bit more fill in the shadow area. So um, I've added a little bit extra using that reflector um, coming in. Um, I was using a grid, Chad, yeah. It had a grid on the front, yeah, to, because I didn't want that spill in those darker images to spill onto the background. Um, we'll look at some of the others. I'll show you some more beach ones, um, just so that you can see um, some more. Again, I love these type of images just with with a model. And again, I, I do like environmental type images too. I love the way that she's just staring back at me in, in the camera. Uh, I, I love that type of look where they're really looking daggers at you right through the lens. It's just beautiful. And, and they're just natural poses that are really, really... Uh, beautiful to look at. Again, dancing ones that are, are used. I love the working with dancers um, because the, it's just stunning when you can work with these dancers to get these gorgeous poses uh, that they can actually come up with. Uh, and there's a couple that I took in that series. I did one here that you can sort of see in black and white as well, just to give a different range and feeling to these images. Um, that's the uh, original image there. Um, so you can sort of see how that, that's the retouched one. That's the original one. Um, and again, just some lovely ones where the girls are, are just standing um, on the, the, the actual stone looking over back at me. And even ones where they're looking down um, in the water, basically looking back, I'll try and pose them so they can sit against the rocks. And I, I, it was great because she, the colour of her clothing here and the hair really had this beach type vibe. Um, so it was just beautiful to have them sitting down. Uh, in that look, and you can sort of see this is the original one, which is, has a bit more colour. Um, I've just taken a little bit of colour out. I do like to tend to desaturate the colours a little bit for sort of that fashiony look, uh, and it's it's just the way I wanted to go. They were gold reflectors there, Delta Dave, yeah, and that's why they got that beautiful gold look. Uh, and again, if you're looking at you know some images of the girls just sort of sitting around. Um, 
on the rocks, just do, just doing a few separate poses. Um, one sitting in the water too can be really beautiful as well. Again, you've got to try and pose them so that you're getting that lovely um, feminine type look. And I love to sort of bring the legs up like close like that and have them cuddling into the, the legs. Um, so it's, it's a great way of, of doing it. Try if you can, if ever you're doing this type of shoot, to watch this horizon, try and make sure it doesn't cut through the head there in this situation. I do always look at that. Sometimes you just can't get around it, but just be conscious of that. Uh, and again, this was just filled with a reflector. Um, the reflector is just over, actually it was in the shadow side just to fill up these shadows a little bit because uh, the sun was streaming in from this side. Um, again, if we're looking at a couple of others, uh, it's nice to get sometimes the girls doing a bit more fashion-y type look uh, with them sort of sitting down like that. You get them to lean on their arms and, and curve their back out. It can give a really, really nice uh, look as well. Um, and sometimes I'll even do these type of looks too where you can use, and this is where the A9 will be fantastic, is you'll get them to do the hair, you know, like stick their hair in the water and then have them flashing their hair up, which can really, really give a nice um, look about the image as well. And the girls tend to love that uh, type of look. Um, to, and then clearly if you also putting them sometimes into the water to have them um, mix and try and get a wave that actually comes in and you can have that um, grabbing them as, as it comes through and shoot the frame the second that that wave uh, tends to hit. And again, I've got some dancing ones here that I love to do um, as well. This was deliberately shot quite high key. Um, you can see these shots here that are done that with the dancer uh, moving in and out um, and having a bit of fun and you know and just sort of to finish off the um, girl sort of sitting on a rock there uh, backlit with the with the sun so yeah there, there you go it gives you some idea about a, a beach shoot that I'm watching so let's throw it up to some questions before we finish because um, we've been just going on about an hour so have you got any questions guys before we um, finish uh, yeah HSS HSS uh, is high speed sync. Like I said, the new Sony Air Remote for the Pro Photo does have HSS. I also have another modifier as well, um, the Light Pro that will work using HSS as well, which I've reviewed ages ago if you go down. The, the issue is with that light, I think it's a Flash Pro uh, light, it, it just didn't resync fast enough for me. Um, and because I've got Pro Photo, I'm just going to use them. I've got multiple different Pro Photo heads, so um, I've got three Pro, uh, Pro Photo B1. So um, I, I'm obviously going to use those. But you don't have to. The, the, you can use high speed sync with the Sony HLV 60s that I had showed last week in my gear. They'll work really, really well with uh, high speed sync. And I stick them on a little adapter which has the three flashes stuck sort of together and then that is enough to overpower the sun, but you have to get close. Um, so you can do great uh, HSS work with the uh, just an off-camera flash as well, guys. So you don't have to pay a fortune for Profoto B1. All the work that I've showed you here, you could do with a lot cheaper gear. It's just that I have it. Don't think the gear will hold you back. It doesn't. You could do the same type of work just with, your, with the HLV60, the Sony normal flashes. Um, you could still get the same type of work. So don't be put off. Um, with me showing Pro Photo, it's just that I've got it, so I'm going to use it. But it's just the same. Um, Keith said, "Love your work." Oh, thank you, Keith. That's that's um, so nice of you to say that. Um, so, have you got any other questions, guys? And I've had a question, Chad. Yes, I did use a grid on that reflector um, because I'll just go back to show you why I used a grid in the case. Um, let me just go back to here. Um, where are we? Let me just switch back to that. There's a grid. Um, there's a grid on the inside of this because the, the issue is if I didn't have a grid on, that light would be lighting up everything. It would come up through the whole lot. So because it's got a grid that sits inside here, that really limits the light to where it's focused. So it focuses that light. The grid basically looks like this. And it only lets the light through the middle parts. Um, so the grid is a real advantage um, if you're doing this type of work because you don't want to be lighting up the background um, 
because it just gets it just stops the image looking right for what I wanted to actually get it to look like. Um, Chad Smith just followed you on Instagram, David. Oh, thanks, Chad. I'm glad you followed me. Thanks so much. Yeah, if you can, guys, follow me on Instagram. That's I post all the time on Instagram. It's just David Osler. Um, and I'll follow you back. Yeah, I always follow people back. So if you put down on there, guys, if you follow me, I'll follow you back uh, on Instagram. Um, Delta Dave said, what trigger? Uh, I use the um, Photix Odin 2 for the um, speed lights, Delta Dave. And I showed that last week, I think. If you look through my live broadcast last week, I went through in the gear that I use, I showed the flashes that I use and also the triggers that I use. So you can check that in there. If you go into the bottom of this once it's up, I'll put my gear I use, excuse me, you'll be able to see all the flashes and everything that I have and it has everything listed in my kit. Um, so you'll be able to look in there if you want to have a look um, what's on there. Yeah, Keith, just add me on Instagram and I'll, I'll add you back. That's the easiest way. Um, oh, so I'll have, have a look, Keith, and I'll see if I can add you back as well. If I don't, remind me. Um, any other questions, guys, before we go? Um, We've got still a lot watching, so throw me a few questions as we finish up, because I'll just put it on here. I noticed a lot of you were asking um, yeah, about flashes and stuff. Well, I think I've already covered that now. Um, let me know too, like I said, whether you think you're going to be waiting for the A7 III. Um, let me know whether you think it's a good upgrade or what you think will be uh, missing. Uh, link down below any questions. Obviously, after this is finished, uh, any questions you want to ask, just put them down below. I always answer questions that are put in there um, personally, so I do spend the time to answer all of your questions. Um, please, obviously, give me a thumbs up and like my page if you haven't liked it because, oh, by the way, I should thank you all. I've just gone over the 5,000 um, viewers uh, or uh, followers, so I can't thank you enough, guys, and that I really, really appreciate you growing with me. Um, like I said, this is just, this for me is is so much about me growing with Sony and it's also about sharing that with you and we're all learning together and I, I want to sort of share everything I do. Like I said, I am going to show some colour theory to you guys. I'll be showing my workflow, all different things over the coming months. Um, so yeah, we'll um, be going. Uh, yeah, Keith, I show all my work each live broadcast. I, I go through some work that I've done just to sort of show you how it was done. Keith said he wants the A99 II, and yeah, I've heard that's really, really good. Um, thanks, LTDA. Thanks so much for that. Um, I just haven't, I just can't justify going to A mount. I mean, clearly, I, I'm sticking with the E mount now. Like I said before in my previous ones, I had around about forty thousand dollars of Nikon gear that I sold and moved to Sony. Um, so I've bought everything E mount, and I'll be probably sticking with that now. But like I've said before, I mean, I'm not link to Sony. I don't get anything from this. Um, so, you know, I could switch again if something better comes up. Um, remember, I'm only in this to make money for my clients. So uh, at this stage, Sony definitely is the best thing that I'm using for me and they keep innovating. I was just a little bit bored with the Nikon, the way that they'd moved. Uh, they just didn't have enough uh, for video for me because I'm doing so much fusion now with video and, and fusion together. Uh, with stills together, so you know I've made the move, and I'm I'm just so happy that they're so lightweight. Uh, you know, it's changed my life basically. Um, well, it looks like we've probably just about finished with cameras. If you have forgot something um, and you wanted to to know, like I said, just leave it down below. All right, guys. Well, we'll leave that. We'll see you again next time, same time next week. I'm going to try and make these for the, for Thursday every day for you guys. Um, Metalwork said the best live chat on YouTube. <laughs> that's um, so that's so nice of you to say that, mate. I really appreciate that. Um, and I'll see you next week for the live one. I'll probably put another couple of videos up during the week, and I will be occasionally doing pop up live shows as well. Um, Keith said I have a few A mount lenses, but I have E mount for the A7R2. You can use a converter, but I'm just not sure how well they work, Keith. Um, like I said, I've never used the A mount lenses. Um, so, all right, guys, well, I'm going to go and head off for a coffee. I think it's just about coffee time for me, uh, my morning coffee, about 10.30. Um, I'll see you again same time next week. Um, until then, uh, I hope you have a fantastic week, guys, and a great day. So uh, bye for now, and thank you so much for supporting me, guys. Thanks so much. Oh, and thanks so much for the donations, guys. You don't know how much that means to me.